Your Excellencies from Kenya, Sweden and Egypt, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this meeting today when we're going to discuss Pioneer the Possible from Sweden and Stockholm to Sharm el Sheikh. My name is Emma Modir Viking. I'm Head of Sustainability at Business Sweden, the Swedish Trade and Invest Council. We are broadcasting live today from the UN conference Stockholm Plus 50 here in Sweden. We are currently in Stockholm, Sweden, having some issues with technology, or it goes well? It's going well? Perfect. So we're currently at the UN conference Stockholm Plus 50 in Stockholm, marking the 50-year anniversary since the first ever conference, UN conference on climate. And today, we have gathered interconnecting stakeholders and high-level representatives from public and private sector, academia and civil society, who together will discuss necessary actions to limit the climate crisis and speed up the green transition. And today, we will focus on the solutions and the possibilities related to this transition. And we will highlight the importance of circular economy, system change, and cross-border and cross-sector collaboration. This is key for us to enable an accelerated actions, to enable global sustainable value chains, and to pioneer the possible. And with us today, to guide us through these very important discussions, I'm happy to introduce you to Ellen Bergman. She is COO of the Circular Economy Network, CradleNet, and you're also the founder of Nordic Circular Hotspot. You will be the moderator today, and without any further ado, I'm happy to hand over to you to kickstart this meeting, which we hope will be an inspiration for transformative and accelerated actions towards COP27 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Dear ministers, speakers and participants, it's my absolute pleasure to be here today and moderate this event. And let's get started right away. Uh, the first session we have is with high level government officials and we will hear uh, what their priorities are and where we're heading right now. And I want to introduce the first speaker, uh, which is Anders Grönvall, State Secretary to the Minister of Climate and the Environment of Sweden. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Yes, thank you for organizing this important event. And I'm, of course, thrilled to see all the key actors here in this room taking responsibility together. As you all know, the latest IPCC report underlines how crucial and uh, how important this work is. We have to cut emissions by half before 2030. And uh, I think there will be no possible, well, uh, there will, this will be not possible without value change, sustainable value change. And exchanging experience is of course important. And uh, we hope that to inspire more countries to accelerate our path, uh, to climate neutrality. As you might heard that uh, our Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson said in her speech, Sweden's green uh, industri industrial revolution cuts emission, creates job today and, and makes opportunity in all parts of the country. This transition is actually necessary for climate and environment, but can also create prosperity. Dece decent jobs and good lives for everyone. Speeding up the transition and phasing out fossil fuels is making society sustainable, stronger and better. Let me also take the opportunity to encourage more business actors to join the first movers coalition. Sweden has joined FMC as a government partner. FMC aids to jumpstart the market by company purchasing materials and transportation from suppliers using net zero or non-carbon solutions. We see this as a means to accelerate global climate action and I'm proud to see Swedish business actors leading the way, both in FMC as well as in the leadership group for uh, industrial transition called the Lead It. We were, uh, we were so happy to see the strong presentation 
presence and engagement by the business community at COP26, you showed the world that the climate action is an opportunity, not a burden. And I hope the message of strengthened implementation coming out of Stockholm Plus 50 will support a strong uh, and ambitious outcome of COP27 in Egypt uh, later this year. The work that is being done here in the multi-stakeholder action hub uh, and sustainable value change will be a very important contribution, I think. So let us use the urgency of climate action to leverage the wider development to gain uh, us set out the 2030 agenda. Sweden's Prime Minister Olaf Palme, as you heard, said in 1972, our future is common. So we have to do it all together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anders. Fantastic. Thank you. And now we move to a representative from Kenya, who is the official co-host to Sweden in the Stockholm Plus 50 uh, conference. And Sweden is, of course, very happy to co-host this together with you. Welcome. Uh, and we're very excited to hear your remarks. Dr. Chris Kipto, Principal Secretary, Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Kenya. Welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, I think this afternoon has been a, a very busy one for me. I've just come from uh, give, uh, making a keynote speech uh, in the launch of this report, which is uh, Stockholm Plus 50, Unlocking a Better Future. And when you look at this report, uh, clearly it indicates that um, we have an action gap. Looking back at 50 years, we are in a crisis on pollution, despite having so many conventions, the BRS, the Minamata, and many others. In, and we have many policies in our national governments and many programs, but we are in a situation where there's still pollution. On climate change, we have UNFCCC, we have Kyoto Protocol, we have Paris Agreement, but we are in a climate crisis. On biodiversity, we have the Convention on Biodiversity. We are talking about the targets, AIKI targets and others. But this report is showing that of all the commitments we have made since 1972 up to now, we have only succeeded to, imp to, uh, to implement 10% of all the commitments. So as we go from, I think I say Glasgow for the COP26, Nairobi for UNEA 5.2 and UNEP at 50, and here in Stockholm, plus 50, and now we are heading to COP27. Clearly, I think uh, Shamal Sheikh will be a forum for action. And I think that is where we want to go, uh, go because we have completed negotiations. So all the COP26 that we have had have been about negotiations. We finished the Paris rule book when we were in COP26. So. Now it is time for action. So today I want to focus myself because I'm speaking to a forum of businesses and it is about really embracing the concept of sustainable uh, development, which requires that businesses change, embrace, um, the, uh, change their models to embrace green and circular um, practices to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity loss and pollution. And this transition to circular economy means tapping into capacities of all the players, whether private sector or government. All of us have responsibilities. Circular economy has uh, more opportunities uh, for handling green greenhouse gas emissions. But we have to embrace three principles. First is on how we design out waste and pollution. So the way we design is important. And for you, you are in business, that is critical because if you have a bottle like this that is not properly designed for more reuse, it will be a waste and will not be achieving much. We also need to keep materials in use for as long as possible. In other words, a concept of circularity so that a material is used as much as possible and we have less to go to waste. And finally, the issue of regeneration of natural systems. So this entire process is responsible for 
generation of green jobs and revenue. If we practice green transition and the circular economy, we shall create jobs and, of course, generate revenue for ourselves. So businesses and industries are called upon to change their model, uh, business models to reduce their costs, reduce risks and losses, provide value to their clients, and avert environmental harm. Some of the changes, therefore, that requ are required for en to enable transition to green and circular economy, as I conclude, are one, advancing sustainable consumption and production, and green business uh, growth through life cycle analysis and product designs to ensure that we have as much as possible zero waste. Number two is that businesses need to adopt uh, regenerative mo uh, business models through use of renewable energy in business um, operations. Businesses also need to close the material loops through adoption of industrial symbiosis, where one industry waste uh, becomes resources for another industry. That would really help a lot. We also need to uh, embrace extended producer responsibility, whether there are regulations or not. You can have self regulations as industries by organizing yourself to ensure that you have take-back schemes. But I think this is also a responsibility of government to ensure we have uh, um, the, the legal and regulatory framework in place. We also need to use ICT to optimize operations and sales, such as increased use of virtual space and automation of processes, such as fleets, logistics, reduction in need for physical office space, online shops, and enhanced use of courier services, among others, so that you don't have a lot of vehicles moving around. We need data. We need to generate data and use them for decision making, particularly for government. We don't have sufficient data ourselves on waste. And this is what we need to enable us to make decisions. We need to develop also infrastructure, enabling infrastructure to operationalize green and circular economy. We need to track progress towards addressing the tri uh, triple planetary crisis. And this means all businesses need to be accountable. So we need to track every business. How green are you and how circular are you? Self-regulation, as I have indicated earlier, and uh, we also need to utilize tax incentives whenever uh, uh, provided for in legislation, or also um, uh, lobby government to provide the, the necessary uh, incentive framework. You need to invest in appropriate alternative products and technologies, and you need to implement innovative measures and public awareness to promote behavioral change and adopt to circular economy standards and codes, labeling and certification. And you need to exploit alternative financing, uh, including blended financing, green financing. And I want to conclude by saying that the government is also challenged to develop appropriate policies and legislation. For us in Kenya, we have already done a sustainable uh, waste management policy that shifts uh, to circular economy, we have come up with extended producer responsibility. We now have a legal uh, framework in parliament to have a law to bring in the aspect of circularity and force everyone to change, um, to, to segregate what's as source. If I had more time, I would have given you our Kenyan case, but I don't have time. So let me conclude by saying that Stockholm Plus 50 sets the stage for acceleration of actions to address planetary crises while Shamal Sheikh will be con calling uh, from moving from negotiation and planning to implementation with a sense of urgency. The hope is that COP27 will be a turning point where the world will come together and demonstrate the requisite political will to take on the climate challenge through concerted, collaborative, and impactful action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Chris Kipto, Principal Secretary, Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Kenya. And now we're moving on to Egypt, that will be the host for COP27 in November. Uh, a huge endeavor to take over. Uh, so we want to know uh, about your hopes and expectations for the next COP meeting. So I want to welcome to the stage Egypt's Minister of Environment, Dr. Yasmin Fouad. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today in this business uh, forum. Um, I'd like to thank the government of Sweden, 
and uh, my uh, sister, Minister of Environment, for really organizing that. But most of all, also thanks for co-chairing from the government of Kenya, bringing everyone around as usual. And as we're speaking to the business community, three important messages that I would like to deliver today very quickly. First of all, the year 2022 is an unprecedented year, not only because of the number of global events that are taking place from UNEA plus five to Stockholm plus 50 to the CBD to the COP27, but because after 50 years of our commitment to a healthy, prosperous and safe planet, we are here to take stock of what we have done to the world that we are living in. And we are reiterating once again our commitment, but today our commitment is for the future generation, not actually for us. And from that perspective, the private sector has a vital role to play. But guess what? That role is not only about commitment, but also about winning, winning the race of keeping our planet Earth as safe as possible, but also gaining from that and having more revenues. From that perspective, COP27 is a COP for implementation that provides a pathway for a just and ambitious transition, an inclusive one where civil society, private sector, uh, youth, women would be part of that process on the run towards COP27. How can we do that? And what is expected from the private sector in Sharm el Sheikh? What is simply expected is to bring your success stories and your wins, to give more hopes to our future generation. If we would like to shape the future correctly, we have to do it once and for all. There's no time for a trial and error and we need to replicate and upscale. And that's the duty of all of us to be done collectively. Egypt has recently gone through a very quick and rapid transformation, a green one, a green transition in all sectors. We've launched the National Climate Change Strategy to 2050. But before that, we have issued the first ever waste management law that gives more opportunity on circular economy and more opportunity for the private sector. A month ago, the cabinet in the middle of a geopolitics and the pandemic has adopted the first ever green economic incentives for the first bat of priority areas that links to the climate strategy and to the sustainable development strategy, giving more room for the private sector investment in energy, in e-mobility, in all waste streams and in the alternative to the single use plastic bag. Finally, we cannot do it alone. So we launched the biggest national climate dialogue in the 27 governorates of Egypt, engaging the public, the religious group, the parliamentarian, the private sector, the NGOs, the youth and the women in a very open and a transparent discussion to make them feel that they can really do it with us. And every action that's being done onward to 2030 onward to 2050 will matter on our survival on the planet Earth, and we all can do it. I invite you all to come to Sharm el Sheikh with solutions that have been implemented, innovative, that can be transferred to the developing countries, that can accelerate our collective action in the spirit of cooperation that never has been shown before in the fight against climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Egypt's Minister of Environment, Dr. Yasmin Poo, thank you so much. Okay. All right, fantastic. You can hear a lot about action and uh, implementation. So it's going to be so interesting to hear the next session. We're moving on in the program now. Uh, and we've heard now from government representatives. Uh, and we want to now invite uh, representatives from ac academia, civil society and UNEP. Uh, they will discuss the urgent needs and necessary circular actions needed to be taken in order to meet the global challenges and the climate crisis. So I want to introduce a fantastic uh, panel. And we have Elisa Tonda, from, uh, the, who is the ho uh, head of consumption and production unit at UNEP to the stage. Dr. Patrick Schröder, Senior Research Fellow at Chatham House. 
We have Diana Garlitska and Suhair Ahmed Koshik from the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Task Force. Welcome to the stage. You will all give uh, short speeches each before uh, the panel discussions. Here we have a mic for your table. Um, about the most important needs and necessary actions for circularity and climate action uh, from your organization's point of view and perspectives. And so please go ahead. Uh, Eliza, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much and pleasure to be with you today. Um, as introduced, I, my organization is UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme. And what I'm going to be referring to as a broad setting of what drives our action is actually the heart of our new medium term strategy that has at its t center a um, mission for us to really be advancing through our initiative, through our project, our fight against the three crises that His Excellency Dr. Kipto also mentioned in its intervention. So how can we, through our action, address the climate crisis, the nature loss crisis and the pollution crisis and seeing how with our activities, with our projects, with our collaboration with different part partners, we can move ahead on those specific actions and we feel that in order to achieve that progress and achieve the multiple benefits of being able to work across these three crises, it's fundamental for us to work in a system type of approach in which we bring together the different partners, uh, industry, the consumers, community, government, academia, youth and the other stakeholders group to really be able to advance on those challenges. And one of the dimensions on which we feel it's particularly effective to frame that communication and that planning is around sector and particularly those sectors that have such a high impact on these triple crises. And these sectors range from textile to mining to plastics. I'm just actually coming back from uh, Dakar, where the uh, preparation for the upcoming negotiation of a legally binding agreement to address plastic pollution has just uh, initiated, but also other sectors such as food, building and construction, and really understanding which are the key actions that are needed and that align us to a common vision of defeating or, or reverting the trends of the crisis of climate, nature and, uh, and pollution. And if we look at textile, for example, this means uh, bringing together innovative business model, new way of financing those business models, but also creating stronger awareness of consumers on those opportunities and those innovative business models and all in all work with governments in such a way that the incentives are in the right direction and are in support of innovation and new business models. While if we look for example at a sector at a system such as the mining one, I feel that what is needed is actually rethinking our relationship with this sector and making sure that we really revalue and reset our relationship with the stakeholders of this uh, of this community of the mining community in such a way that as we're going to so deeply rely on mine resources for uh, the green transition that is ahead of us we really help collectively to make that transition and that transformation in such a way that it's not harmful for the environment and it's not harmful for society Thank you so much. And an applause, I would, th I would say. Thank you so much, Eliza. Uh, next, we have Dr. Patrick Scherder, Senior Research Fellow at Chatham House, uh, to give a short speech. Welcome. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, very exciting. Um, and uh, so, yes, in terms of what we're doing at Chatham House, we're a think tank and we do research and engagement on the circular economy. And um, we've been focusing on the global dimension of this transition. Um, so we're looking at, we 
how governments are designing and implementing policies. Um, we're looking at the implications for global trade. Um, we're also looking at um, the issues around how to how to finance circular economy innovations and in businesses, and um, also the role of uh, the circular economy to achieve the SDGs. So those are some of the areas that we've been um, working on, and in in the run-up to Stockholm, um, so about three months ago, um, we've had discussions with the Stockholm Plus 50 Secretariat of what we could do to elevate the circular economy at Stockholm Plus 50, use it as a springboard, uh, really to um, promote it as an approach to the triple crisis and, and um, the SDGs. And um, as a result, we then started uh, stakeholder consultations so about um, over the last few months, we consulted with about 100 different groups from across the world, ranging from representatives of ministries, but also waste picker uh, organizations, um, African entrepreneurs uh, working on digital solutions, um, but yeah, NGOs and, and business. So very wide consultations that we uh, conducted, including also um, UN uh, system. Um, so, and the outcome of these consultations uh, was that what's actually needed now at this stage is that we have a global roadmap uh, to lead us to an inclusive circular economy. And um, so, yeah, the reason why, why do we need such a, a global approach, a global roadmap? So what, what we see at the moment is that there's good progress on national level. Many governments have policies, many governments have done roadmaps. Um, businesses are doing a lot already, but when there's, there's nothing on the international level that connects these things properly. So we think um, uh, that's, that's a bit of a gap, and, and many stakeholders confirm that, uh, that, that this would be really valuable to have a more global um, approach to this. And when we launched, um, actually, uh, the roadmap yesterday. So what we launched actually isn't actually a fully developed roadmap, but the concept and some suggestions what this process could be, what it could be, uh, could achieve. And again, yesterday um, we had representatives from leading uh, organizations working in the circular economy, uh, including PACE, the um, platform for accelerating the circular economy, uh, UNAP joined, um, the governments of Scotland and Japan, um, then uh, the European Stakeholder Forum, the African Development Bank, and th really the message that came out of the session we had yesterday, um, people are ready. So um, there's really some good momentum behind that and um, uh, we can really take this opportunity to start a process. Um, I, maybe I, I won't go into detail what is in there, but I have some flyers with a QR code, um, and then you can uh, access the digital copy of, of the document that we have. Maybe and you can just Google it and find yeah, the you global roadmap, Chatham House. Yes, exactly. Great. Or you can, um, yes. Okay. Yeah, thank Sorry. you so much. Thanks. All right, and next we have uh, Diana Gerlitzka from the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Task Force. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you know, you would think that young people are difficult to ignore because they make up 40% of the world population, roughly. Um, but some manage to. And um, the success of governance, of sustainable development, very much boils down to a very fruitful, inclusive cooperation of all the stakeholders. And we're talking about um, the states, governments, um, NGOs, uh, individuals, businesses, and even media, if you want. And um, they inclusion of youth in decision making in uh, um, policy development is pretty much a determinant factor of the success of the governance of sustainable development. Um, over the past six months, a bit more than that, um, Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Task Force was working on developing a policy paper in consultation with um, many organizations, youth representatives, in fact, youth globally. We came up with a document that really summarizes the requests and perception, perspective of young people towards um, the change that is needed. In the context of our conversation today, when we talk about the cooperation between um, general society, academia and youth. What would be relevant to mention out of the document we worked on um, 
the sharing of the um, scientific findings and free access to information and um, knowledge globally, um, rethinking of um, value chains and supply uh, chains in consideration with agricultural context, um, fuel, fossil fuel infrastructure that has to be resought and um, so much more in the context of greenhouse gas emissions impact on um, and the need for recognizing it. When we think about ways to collaborate, there are many um, solutions already, but it would be really necessary to amplify the successful best practices that are out there for us to find more matching points and points of uh, um, getting together, if you want, for that discussion to continue and to make sure that we really include one another in our processes and developments. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and we have some room for some questions. Um, Patrick, what, what action will have the largest impact for the global south and north, you think? So, I mean, one, one of the one of the key key issues is, as I mentioned before, there's really a, a finance gap to, towards circular um, innovation, circular businesses, and um, I think that that would make a, a huge impact both in the global north and global south. But um, what's currently missing? What I mean, we, what, um, what we've analysed um, as well as the way circular finance at the moment works, most of the investments go into Global North. So um, we need, really need to address this issue by also investing into those um, new business models and technologies in, in the Global South. And um, that's also where, where business and um, finance have a, have a key role to play. And that's also that's one aspect also that we have in the roadmap. Um, we've outlined a number of action-oriented initiatives that, that could be launched. Um, in partnership, for example, with the private sector, really, and, and yeah, private and public sector, really to de-risk um, circular finance and investments. Um, maybe one idea that came up was also maybe we need a circular economy fund. Um, it should be several billions, not, not millions, Great really, idea. To, to advance um, the transition more quickly. Good. Okay, so um, Suhar, what policies do you want to see be implemented? Okay, thank you. Thanks for uh, sharing the space with you and giving you the uh, platform to speak about the expectations and demands and policies. So currently we're going through a time when actually youth and children are grappling with a lot of environmental crisis. We are growing through, or going through a time when we are facing biodiversity loss, we're facing climate change consequences, we are facing plastic issues. And today, uh, within this very short time, I want to share two policies that we want to uh, be implemented by our policymakers and the member states. One is uh, that already uh, uh, she has said that about the Global Plastic Treaty that's being prepared and the work behind that is underway. And this policy, uh, this policy uh, treaty should be implemented by all the member states and all the goals and targets of this policy. Uh, of this uh, uh, agreement or instrument should be legally binding because we don't afford more time for our member states to uh, uh, or the conventions to produce a more uh, voluntary targets and we don't afford more time for our global leaders to come to uh, these kind of forums and COPs to lecture us what our common responsibilities are rather than focusing what their responsibilities are and do some homeworks. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so uh, we need, I think we need uh, quick answers to this one. What are the key messages and agendas that need extra attention on the road to and at COP27? Uh, do you want to go, Lisa? Um, I'm happy to go and I'll be very quick. <laughs> and in my mind, especially if we look at circularity and its connection with climate, where we need to go is from science to action. And I think in the opening intervention that was alluded to, I think we have a clear understanding of the potential, but we're still not tapping into those potential. And these will surely be the driving force for them to come to scale. 
Thank you. Patrick, quick answer. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I agree with the science to action, absolutely. So, like, the latest IPCC report also shows the potential of the circular economy in climate mitigation. That's now also becoming increasingly clear. Also, the, the issues around demand side um, measures are really important. Mm. And um, maybe finally also, a circular economy will be on, based on renewables. So, um, phase out of fossil fuels as part of the transition to a, renew, uh, to a circular economy. Great. I think we're out of time, actually. So thank you so much to this panel. Uh, good. Thank you for coming. So step down. All right. Now we're moving on to another panel session, and we're going to talk about mobility of the future. We've heard about the urgent needs and necessary actions that needs to be taken. And we will now focus a, m a bit more on the solutions and the role of innovation uh, that was specifically highlighted in the latest IPCC report. As a leader in innovation and sustainability, Sweden has become a pioneer in world-leading solutions and environmental policies that need, need to drive uh, climate action uh, globally. With the private sector as a driving force, Sweden is on its journey to become the world's first fossil-free welfare nation. We have gathered some of the most front-running pioneering uh, global companies in Sweden here today, and we will now discuss how to rethink business models, transform how industries are using materials, and how to accelerate the transition into circular and decarbonized uh, value chains. We will do this in three sessions. First, we have companies representing the future of mobility. After that, we have a group from the textile sector. And last but not least, we have companies representing uh, resources, recycling, furniture, and production and packaging sector. And uh, first, we're going to discuss mobility of the future. And I want to welcome to the stage Christopher Laurel, Senior Vice President, Research and Public Affairs of Enride. Welcome. Fredrika Klarén, Head, Head Sustainability of Polestar. Jonas Otterheim, Head of Climate Action at Volvo Cars. And Erik Persson, Segment Manager, Transport and Infrastructure at Hitachi In uh, Energy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we're going diving straight into the issue here. Um, so what do you hope to achieve and what positive effect do you think your company's in initiatives have for the outside world? Uh, Erik Persson, do you want to answer that one? Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think, first of all, coming from a global company like Hitachi Energy, uh, we have been in the power grids business and uh, for more than 100 years. And uh, to, we are sort of the invisible, in quotation mark, enabler in this transition. And if we look at Sweden specifically, I think it's a great playground to test out new business models, new technology, which could be copied and scaled to, to the rest of the world. And I think that's the, the key what we want to achieve if you look at it from a Swedish perspective. Great. Okay, so how do we make it a reality? What solutions do we have in place today and what needs to be done? Jonas Otterheim, Volvo Cars. I think it's important to recognize there are plenty of solutions technically available. It's just that we are not implementing them. For example, if we talk electric cars, well, at COP26, we signed the declaration where we want to ban fossil fuel or internal combustion engine vehicles, but very few other OEMs want to do that. A few weeks back, the same uh, pledge was more or less done. Us and one more globally OEM signed the same. So apparently, the industry is not ready to ban for, uh, industrial con uh, internal combustion engine vehicles by 2035. And of course, that is too late. So just electric cars, the technology is there. We just need to act on it. The same with steel. Well, we see that fossil-free steel is happening. We just need to make sure that it's commercially available in time so we can implement it. So we need to steer towards such solutions. So, for example, the Steel Zero uh, initiative is a perfect example of that. We need to show that there is a clear demand for such solutions and then act on it instead of just talking of such. Mm. You also had some solutions that you want to share. Yeah, I, I, would, I would fully agree with you. I mean, we, we have the technology, it's already available. We need clear incentives and, and clear directions. And also, if you look at it from a point of a, a law perspective, I think the iterations need to be faster. We need, we need to move much faster than, than we are doing today. It's clear. Great. And how are Swedish pioneers or business leaders combining increased sales and reducing climate impact? Do you want to answer that, Fredrika Klarier uh, well, Polsar? 
It's, I mean, to, to reiterate what the previous speakers have been talking about, it's really about the fact that we have technology, we have solutions now, we are just not implementing at the pace that we need. And when it comes to, to uh, electric vehicles, uh, we have an industry where the solution have never been clear that it is scalable, uh, but still we see that only a few percent of the global car stock uh, are uh, electric vehicles. Um, so we know that we need to grow exponentially during this decade if we are to show up in time for the climate crisis as an industry, but we need to secure that we decouple that growth mm. from environmental impact. So at Polestar, we really want to talk about, okay, so EVs are better, but they are absolutely not sustainable or perfect. How can we, during this decade, not after 2030, but during this decade, secure that we find the solutions that bring the emissions down in time? So we've launched the Pulsar Zero project, for example. We have set out to create a fully climate neutral car by 2030. Uh, and that is a moonshot goal. Uh, if any, at least that's how we feel about it, because we don't know exactly how we're gonna how we're gonna do that. But we need to create this sense of urgency that it's really up to us as a company to find these solutions now. And at Polestar, we will grow, uh, but we need to decouple that growth. And we we got a really good indicator that we can enable that. We actually were able to last year when we grew the way we grew and expanded to more markets and increased production volumes to actually reduce the relative um, greenhouse gas emission by 6%. So we got this indication that we can actually do this if we just try to be um, as efficient as possible in this growth. Really good. All right. Um, how uh, are Swedish... Uh, sorry, what do you think Sweden can teach the world when it comes to climate action? Maybe you want to answer that. I think we can teach the world a lot. Uh, and I would like to start by saying that uh, I just love what you just pointed out, Eric, Jonas and Fredrika, because on these kinds of stages, we have been saying for years that this is not a tech problem. The technologies of the future, they are already here today. And when we see the digitalization, when we see electrification and also autonomous technology, that we are pioneering. Mm -hmm. We have so much potential in not only making an impact for for the world coming out of Sweden when it comes to environmental issues, but also when it comes to safety and also creating a business case uh, that also makes sense going forward due to driver shortages as well as cost increases. Uh, so technology is the answer. That's the way we see it. Um, what we also sort of see uh, is um, one particular challenge that we are uh, really trying to, to work hard on, and that is the fact that we are subsidizing the old system. The old transportation system uh, is, um, is uh, essentially something that we need to get rid of. We need to disrupt it and create a completely new one. And if you look at the reports coming out from the IMF, we have 6.8% of global GDP going to fossil fuel subsidies. Mm. So um, what we really hope is that we'll be able not only to join forces in, in sort of saying that technology is the answer to a lot of these problems, but also joining forces in seeing to that the disappointment that we had at COP26 becomes a success when we reach our middle L shake. Uh, we got a little bit of progress, but if we can get uh, these subsidies out of the way so we can really build, just imagine what we could do with 6.8% of global GDP in scaling these solutions for the future. Absolutely. Yes. C can I build on that? Because I, I very much agree with what you say, but on top of that, I think it's very important to recognize that we have technologies in place to do, well, similar to what we all talk about, but of course there is a challenge to do the rest. So that we know that there are hard to abate areas, and that is where, well, circular economy will come in. I think even though we talk about the technology solutions here, I think Sweden can t well, um, t teach others about collaboration. Because, well, we as companies and with others, we need to collaborate with many other companies, usually others than we usually think of, to try to find these business models, share the waste and avoid that we degrade materials. Because that can't happen anymore. Because in practice, sort of, we cannot continue to build a car as we usually have built it. That won't work, even though we can take technology to some degree, but we can't take it all the way unless we also change the business model mindset. 
Mm. Yes. Uh, I think just to add on top of that, I mean, like Hitachi Energy, we are looking into that as well, uh, to, into the circular economy and, and to reuse materials. So if we take, for example, our transformer business, we cooperate with Stena Metal to really recycle uh, the metal inside of the transformer once it is sort of end of life at the customer and then reuse it in new products. And I think that is really the key. And I think you're all looking into that as well. I mean, to build a circular economy. Mm. Great. And what are, what are the biggest challenges to make this happen faster? You're talking about urgency and speeding up. I mean, anybody wants to? <laughs> yes? Yeah, I, I can jump in and continue to build on, on the things that you said, Jonas. Um, five years ago, no one thought it would be possible to build electric trucks, heavy duty electric trucks. Now we have them in operations. Yeah, the company I represent has the biggest fleet in Europe, in fact, and we are making the biggest deals globally. Yeah, I think we in Sweden have a role to play in being brave and also believing that the technologies that we can create in this country can become export successes that can change the way in which we sort of see mm -hmm. mobility, both in, in the north and the south of the globe. So being brave and, and really challenging old beliefs and challenging the system mm -hmm. and investing in what starts as a vision and build from, from that point on. Yeah, we have a history of doing that in, in Sweden and I think there are a lot of lessons to learn from that. Fredrika. Accountability. Uh, we've been, I've worked with sustainability for more than 10 years. Uh, I've stood at these stages and, and heard other people stand on stages and talk. I've read sustainability reports for many years from leading Swedish companies. Uh, we, we, we need to secure that we have a higher uh, degree of accountability through transparency that is harmonized so that we, during this very impactful set of years that we have before us, really can secure that we can measure the progress now and really see that we start bending the curve and increasing circularity. Um, so that's that's a message that, that we're going to go mm. to COP with. Uh, it doesn't have to be that hard. I mean, mm. we're doing life cycle assessments together and publishing them for our consumers to see the carbon footprints of Volvo and Polestar cars. You don't have to regulate this. There can be you can tap into the drive that you have and the knowledge that you have within companies and just start being transparent and more accountable. Mm. Great. All right, so the last question to the panel is, what are the key messages and agendas and is extra tension on the road to and at COP27? I just covered mine, so covered I'll, I'll let done. you uh, talk. <laughs> Do you yeah. want to go next? Yeah. I can start, yes. Uh, I think, well, at COP26, we talked about the importance of the energy transition. I think that is still very relevant. We are dependent on all our suppliers to also do the shift. And if they don't reduce their emissions, we won't be able to reduce our full scope one to three emissions. At COP26, we talked about the importance of a global price on CO2. Very true still. Mm. We are currently implementing an internal price because we still feel that we cannot wait for others to do it. And doing that scope one, two, three, I'm getting quite frustrated, but there are very few public examples of companies telling what they're doing and telling what they're doing wrong because it's not that easy, but daring to fail and talking about the mm. learnings. Of it, I think mm. that is critical here. And then, of course, the, well, we need to go to electric cars. So I can just reiterate that again. Daring to fail. I would summarize it in basically two words, and it's speed and agility. Mm. Uh, and that's what's needed, both from a technical point of view to get the solutions out there and from a law point of view and so on. So speed and agility. Do you have... Yeah, I, I think I already covered, you covered mine as well. Too. But uh, it's so definitely a matter of uh, getting rid of these subsidies, not only the explicit, mm. but also the implicit. Um, there is so m much potential in stopping supporting the old system and, and really believing in, in the new one and believing in the new one's power to, to transform all our industries. So, um, yeah, let's turn subsidies into real investments instead at COP27. Mm. Great. And you've been in a super efficient uh, panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great insights and discussions. All right, now we're moving on to another sector. We're going to talk to the textile sector for the next uh, se session. And welcome to the stage, Leila Ertur, Head of Sustainability at H&M Group. Harald Kavalli Björkman, Chief Growth Officer at Renewcell. Henrik Tegner, EVP, EVP and Head of Strategy and Sustainability at AFRI. Welcome. 
And do you all have mics? No, not yet. So we will wait a while until we have new and fresh ones. All right, welcome. Uh, what do you hope to achieve and what positive effect do you think your company's initiatives have for the outside world? Do you want to go first, Leila? Of course. And thank you very much for this opportunity to start with. Um, I think climate, cl climate crisis comes with all urgencies and we are taking our responsibility. Beginning of this year, we have committed to reduce our absolute emissions by 2030, 56%. And by 2040, we are aimed to be net zero. To start with that, uh, we also launch our 500 million euros sustainability link bonds uh, to make sure that we are supporting green financing. I will come to that in a minute. But main idea was that to create internal system that we are also turning ambitions to action. Uh, we build up our four-level uh, climate strategy. The first one is to, uh, we aim to have measure our impact because you need to know where you are and what is your challenges to be able to create the roadmap and share this transparently in our last year report. Then when it comes to reductions, beginning of this year also, we say we will not onboard any more suppliers with on-site coal boilers. That's a big step for a textile company uh, or a fashion company, let's say, because if you are working, uh, we will know that the biggest uh, emissions comes from the mills where we have production site. And it's a big limitation in a way that when you are producing developing countries in the world. But we have been bold to say that we are stopping onboarding new suppliers to make sure that we're not adding ourselves any further challenges. With our green investment team, we are also investing together with our suppliers to transform their operations to renewable energies as much as possible. This is something we need even further help from the governments to help us to find more substitutes or coal boilers to make sure that we are widely using renewable energies. We are also taking big steps to transform our business model to circular fashion. We know that fashion can be circular. We know that also innovation can support us. In many ways, we are investing companies, startups, towards our investment arm call-up uh, to companies who has greater ideas for recycling technologies, using artificial intelligence to measure our impact, etc. Uh, in similar ways. RenewCell is one of our first uh, partnership we have done to show the industry also recycling is even possible for further lengths. Last but not least, we have developed our internal carbon pricing tool. So if you're a designer, if you choose this material to that material, you know your impact. And the better you choose your product, uh, processes, materials, way of transport, you will hopefully help your margins to be look better. So our way of contributing has been that truly, of course, committing first, but also making sure that we are turning our ambitions to actions. Really good. Thank you. And your sector, uh, well, the whole textile sector, has a strong connection to the loss of biodiversity. How do you tackle the, these uh, challenges, Harald Renusel? Well, that is true. Uh, textiles, through its use of raw materials needed to make the fibers that make up the clothes that we all wear and like to have on our skins, they need fibers and they need to come from somewhere. And most of the popular, or most of the fibers actually used today are, of course, polyesters, fossil based. Uh, it's pumped from the ground. But many of the, a big chunk of the rest of the fibers are made from cotton. Uh, it's grown uh, in, in crop plants across the world. It's also made from trees, from uh, going into viscose or lyocell. So those are the three big fibers, polyester, cotton and viscose. Now, cotton and viscose, um, they, uh, in, their, in the cultivation of these crops and, and these trees and these forests that they come from, it has a massive impact on, 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 on biodiversity, of course. Uh, they're both monocultures. Uh, at least the plantation forests, and if you're not going in a plantation forest, you're going into old growth forest, which you need to keep and, and, and maintain for that. About 150, or actually now by now, 200 million trees per year are cut down to make clothes for us. And 11%, I believe, of all pesticides in use are used to, 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 um, uh, to grow uh, cotton that we wear, want to wear. And the way we can go about uh, diminishing this impact that that has is by going circular. Find a way to get them 
materials, the raw materials for making those fibers in the textiles themselves. The textiles industry has and still is a very linear value chain. You, you, you get your raw material and then you end up in landfill or incineration at the end. Maybe you have some reuse, hopefully, along the line. But uh, after that, due to the technological um, uh, limitations uh, that have been in, in reprocessing of these kinds of, gar uh, of textile products, the quality has not been there to take back clothes and put them back into that value chain. And that's what we do at Renew Cell. We make sure that we can make fashion circular, make the flow of materials circular, and diminish the need for, for harming biodiversity across the world uh, uh, to get to the fibers that we need to have in our clothes. And we do that in our new or uh, soon to be open plant in Sundsvall in Sweden, um, uh, where we're going to recycle eventually 120,000 tons of textile waste per year. So close to 600 million t-shirts per year. And this is the first and the largest of its kind that we're building, specifically to, to, to lighten the load that, that, that fashion has on biodiversity and many other uh, impact categories, of course. Yes, go ahead. I really like all of this and I think that the, the recycling is one important factor. I think one other factor that we're working a lot with in, in AFRI is also the, the forest management. So if we have, for, for example, forest-based fibers as raw materials. So uh, we use digital technologies to uh, better predict the growth of uh, the forest. So all the way from, from planting to harvesting. So to better, uh, better forest management, we can reduce the use of pesticides uh, and we can also work with the biodiversity issues and, and really tackle them in a way. Because I think for sure, recycling is a big, big thing, but it's not going to solve everything. So we also need to work with the biodiversity in uh, the source of the raw materials. Good. So that's kind of connected to what the Minister of Kenya said before, that we need data. So that's you fully agree. the data. That's really good. Great. So another question is, um, how are Swedish bi uh, pioneers, business leaders act is, uh, acting as role models and contributing to behavioral changes in society and in business to eliminate overconsumption, extraction and waste landfill? Do you want to? I can, sure. Yep. I'm actually just looking at the crowd. We are really closing the loop here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a way, <laughs> with our brands and f companies. Um, as a Swedish brand, I think we have a crucial role to play. I mean, to make fashion from our size uh, available for everyone, accessible circular choices, and make sure that we are reaching young generation with our offer. Uh, we have been implementing many circular business model customer facing in our uh, stores and online. Uh, you might have heard that we have been, gar we have been having garment collecting uh, program for almost a decade now that you can bring your unused product to our stores and you get a discount card for that. And hopefully we got those garments and either recycle or use as a second hand. Uh, this is an amazing example of one of them. But recently we also started up remake, reuse, tailoring, renting different offers in our stores to make that we are creating habit in our customers that they can have options when they are buying our products if it is garments or another part we have launched selfie our second hand platform started with one country in sweden now up to 20 countries and we are amazed with the attention and interest we are getting second hand clothing more than that, I think technology improvement and supporting innovation is greater strength in Sweden. Uh, we have committed to be 100% sustainable materials by 2025 20, and use 30% recycled material. We already last year jumped our recycled materials from 5% to 17.9%, tripled. And we are quite comfortable that we will reach our 2025 goal. And this is again thanks to innovation and also our ability to invest uh, the new companies that we believe in. So I believe in Sweden, especially with the young generation also, educating our customers, being transparent about our impact. We work with HIG uh, on product transparency. So when you read the QR code in our products, you can see how much water has been used, the factory it has been produced, region, energy grids, and even more example of social part, if the factory employs women, what is the percentage? Through that, I believe, we also enable our customers to make right choices. There are various examples I can talk, but I will also a little bit leave room to you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> a lot to do. But, 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 but um, uh, 
I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. But, well, one thing, yeah. So uh, about Sweden in particular, I mean, it could. It's actually kind of surprising to see a, a bunch of people representing Swedish companies talking about the textile industry. I mean, the common knowledge is that we shifted that out in the '60s or something like that. Mm. But two things that we do have in Sweden um, that 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 is really important is on the one hand, you know, amazing design, uh, design leading design companies um, uh, on the one side, and then we have uh, a, a, an amazing process industry. We are great at uh, efficient efficient um, uh, production of, of, of uh, various refined products, owing much to our you know experience from steel and from 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 forest man and forestry and things like that. And these are the types of two levers that we kind of need to push on specifically in fashion in order to get the circular economy rolling. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, so so it's then coming back it's not at all surprising that that a uh, uh, and h&m uh, uh, come from sweden and this is where we can be really at the forefront of the circular economy within fashion mm. so, yeah. absolutely okay so how do we make it a reality then what solutions do we have in place today and what needs to be done henrik yeah, yeah, sure. That's a great question. And I mean, we, we talked before that technology is available. And I would say that to some extent technology is available, but I think there is also a lot more to be done in order to develop this technology. And I mean, Renew Cell Europe present one area here. And I think this is, this is an area where we have seen a lot of development in the le uh, last years, and I, I'm sure more will come. Because we know that still the recycled fibers have been quite complex and quite expensive. Okay, But more is happening there for sure on recycling. I think we also need to look at these alternative sources of raw materials, right? We cannot rely on, uh, on just, uh, you know, pl plastic based um, or, and uh, cotton based and you get a lot of microfibers, etc. So we need to find also alternative sources on cellulosic based um, sources. But then um, I think we, when, when we talk about the the circularity, uh, we need to look at the, the whole circle here, which I think is very important. And you talked already about how H&M work with, uh, with the different uh, types of uh, clean energy, reduced energy consumption, reduced water consumption, reduced use of chemicals in the production. So I think there's a lot to be done also in the efficiency uh, of existing production. And then uh, looking at uh, the, the whole circle, as I said, so what about the transports? Uh, storage, the waste across all of this uh, cycle. So I think that's what, uh, what, what we think quite a lot about, you know, how do we make all of this hang together? And I think that's, it's good that we're all on the stage together here because I think we're representing a good part of the circle here. Um, I, I think it's also about the change of mindset. And you talked about some great examples of how consumers can act in a different way. Because uh, for sure, uh, the, the raw materials and the recycling in the end is important. But we also need to think about the other possibilities in the circular economy of uh, reuse, of sharing, uh, repairing, uh, remaking. So lots of other opportunities that we need to follow as well. Then I think I like what you what you ended on because I think transparency to me is also very very important. It's, it's easy to talk about this here, but how do we create um, the trust with consumers that we are really doing the right thing? And I think that that is going to be su super critical. Great. All right. So the question I've been asking all the panels, I'm going to ask you as well. Uh, what are the key messages and agendas that need extra attention on the road to and at COP27? Um. I have two points here. The first one is we are taking our responsibility. We are advocating uh, for our strategy, taking all the opportunities. But I also would like to see more collaboration from policymakers, uh, especially the countries that we are doing productions. Because what we are seeing that in many of the countries that we are producing, replacing coal boilers, the renewable energies or substitutes are not available or not promoted. So it's a big road blocker. So truly, all together, we need to move action to ambition, uh, ambition to action and make sure that it's enabled for corporations to reach. Second part is we do see some inequities in the laws when it comes to carbon taxations. For example, uh, incentives uh, to the corporate companies. Um, I was just giving an example from Green Investment Team, and we just signed up with our three suppliers in Indonesia, couple of, uh, India, a couple of weeks back. Uh, and with this agreement, we're going to reduce 80,000 ton carbon. Uh, with helping them to turn to more renewable energy. But we can only get incentivized as much as our share. 
And this, I feel, that needs to be motivated further more for uh, corporations to get more incentives to invest further in different processing, production, transport, uh, transportation, and helping us to have streamlined the regulations over there. So uh, I bring with me two things to Shalma Sheik, uh, and I'm hoping that, again, the biggest part is really action together, advocate private companies, NGOs, government, policymakers. It's time to come together and really turn into action. Thank you. Super short now. <laughs> Scale and commitment, I'd say. We're talking about, about the technologies exist, and as an innovator representing here, it, it, it's, you know, the, inve the money will flow when, when the OEMs, so to speak, the end users commit to, uh, to, to, to scaling it up. We're ready, we're ready to invest, but we need that you know, security in order to, to go there. Great. So I think that there are, uh, for me, two key takeaways. So one is I think that business is the key to accelerate the transition towards a sustainable society. So make sure that governments point in the direction that we want to go, but make sure that you let business be a part of it and, and we can accelerate the transition. And lastly, energy is at the center of this trans, uh, transformation. So don't forget uh, the decarbonization uh, of energy and make sure that we have access to clean energy whenever it's needed. Great. Thank you so much to the panel. Thank you, Thank you so much for coming. Uh, All right. We're moving on to the next panel. And the last session we have are with representatives from uh, the resource, recycling, furniture, and processing and packaging sector. Welcome to the stage. Ulf Johansson, Global Wood Supply and Forestry Manager at Inter IKEA Group. Eja Heitevu, Group VP Corporate Affairs at Tetra Pak. Linnea Selberg, product leader and owner's representatives at uh, Rangsells, and Martin Pei, EVP and CTO at SSAB. Welcome. <laughs> Does everybody have mics? Great. Um, so what do you hope to achieve and what positive effect do you think your company's initiatives have for the outside world? Do you, Linnea, want to go first? Uh, thank you. Um, if we are serious about creating a sustainable society, we need to start using the raw materials that we already have over and over again. And this is something we work with at Rank Cells. We offer circular methods for producing the key ni nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus from wastewater. And we need these uh, to produce food. It becomes increasingly important with the food crisis we see today. And one of the problems we have is that uh, the nutrients we use today is produced in pretty problematic ways. We have phosphorus, that's a finite resource. We mine this in Russia and Morocco, and the phosphate rock is increasingly contaminated with cadmium and uranium. And then we have nitrogen, which is produced by burning fossil gas. And it actually stands for 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions, putting it right up there with air traffic as one of the worst things for our climate. And the crazy thing about this is that we don't actually need to produce nutrients this way, this way because we have um, an essentially endless mine of phosphorus and nitrogen in our sewage right below us. We can recycle this, but today we just throw it away. And the main problem here is the legislation, uh, which in a lot of countries, it's actually illegal to sell or to use recycled nutrients. So this is something we would like to urge everyone here to help change so that we can unlock this endless mine of sustainable circular nutrients. Great, thank you. There is a big resource and supply chain crisis going on right now alongside the climate crisis. What are your thoughts and strategies now when it comes to sourcing materials, nutrients and food, for example? And what needs, um, what are needed to make more companies buy secondhand materials and products? Do you want to answer that? Sure. So, um, so I, I represent Tetra Pak, and many of you probably know Tetra Pak as a as a packaging company, and and that's uh, that's exactly what we are. Uh, so, 70 years ago, uh, we we invented a very revolutionary uh, package here in in Sweden. But I think it's very important to know the the, the bigger picture. So, we are one of the world's uh, largest. Uh, 
uh, food processing and uh, packaging solutions companies. So when we talk about the, the solutions uh, of, of the current climate change or, or the role of uh, um, uh, basically what, what circular economy can play, I think we are one of those companies who are really in the core of the, the world's uh, kind of uh, food systems. And we see that uh, having a role to play there from <coughs> design to actually looking into partnerships and ecosystems in, in terms of how you can uh, turn, for instance, food residues or, or side streams from processing to, to new uh, opportunities, whether it is edible uh, food or, or it can be you know, for, for animal feed and things like that. So there are endless opportunities within the food uh, uh, value chain, uh, which actually, you know, obviously the food plays a key role. A quarter of the world's emissions are, are in food. And colleagues like uh, on IKEA, I know, are on the same track, and, and I think we're all talking about the same thing, the transformation in the food systems, which is where circular economy can really play an enabling role. Great. Uh, Ulf, uh, you work at IKEA. Do you yes. want to have a go at that yeah. question as well? Do you want me to repeat it? Or no, absolutely. Uh, I'm happy to do that. I'm working for IKEA, working with wood supply and forestry. And... Um, Indeed, it is a crisis, uh, as, you, as you said before. And of course, uh, I guess it's almost impossible for anyone to predict uh, such a disruptive event that we have met for the last two years. But, but um, uh, when we sat down a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, uh, and worked out IKEA's forest positive agenda for 2030, we put up a few criteria that we thought were, were important to make the strategic direction so robust that it should be able to stand in different scenarios. And one was, for example, globalization versus deforestation. Uh, sorry, de globalization versus deglobalization. Another one was uh, supply constraint of materials, so particularly renewable materials then. And what we decided then was to di di uh, direct IKEA towards maximizing the use of recycled wood step up the speed in innovations in using material more mindful. Shouldn't be anything new for, for IKEA, uh, but there are new technologies, of course, today that can make this even better. So basically what we say in our daily work, making more from less, making more furniture from every cubic meter consumed. And also invest in technologies to uh, be more flexible in our material uses. So at some point we can say that we were a little bit prepared for what happened, but of course now we need to execute all our plans much faster than we thought a couple of years ago. And one thing we have seen uh, in the last years is that there is a need for a much stronger action and dialogue between the private sector and, and uh, governments when it comes to building infrastructure for recycling. Uh, recyc using recycled wood is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, but we can also see that um, if we look at the investments in R&D in the forestry sector, we are quite conservative. Uh, and we need to really challenge ourselves to do this in a better way. Because and for one, uh, recycling wood then is one example where if we succeed in this, we will create a much bigger sustainable material source for us. We will reduce the pressure on the world's forest and we will uh, enable ourselves to store carbon for a long, long time. Uh, so there is a lot of opportunities in this. And there are also good examples. The technology exists. There are countries like Italy, for example, where we have huge production units already running on 100% recycled wood, while there are other countries in the world that still has a, a road to go or a way to go. Uh, but I am really optimistic that if we work together with strong uh, actions, uh, we can solve this. Absolutely. Martin Pei, you work at SSAB. Uh, is there a demand for, uh, from the market for fossil-free steel? Because you work with hybrids that now are making fossil-free steel. And how do we create a broad market-driven demand for fossil-free materials? Yes, uh, uh, now we see clearly there is a very strong demand from uh, our uh, important customer segments. Uh, yesterday, Volvo delivered the first real vehicle, huge one, to uh, NCC, which is a very important milestone for us. When we started uh, in 2016, uh, when we launched the hybrid initiative, uh, the, the situation was uh, different uh, because at that time, the whole industry really were facing the challenges, uh, thinking what can we do? 
we all know that steel is extremely important material. Steel is uh, fantastic in a way, it can be recycled again and again. But only by recycling steel is not enough, because the world need of steel is going to increase significantly in the coming decades. So we need to develop a, a technology also making steel from iron ore without emissions, huge emissions that uh, the industry do today. So that's why we launched the hybrid initiative together with uh, LKB in Vattenfall. We want to challenge this almost a thousand year technology and use hydrogen instead to, of coal that we use today, the industry. And with that, if we succeed, then we can cut 10% of Sweden's emission and the whole steel industry worldwide st stands for 7% of CO2 emissions. It's a huge impact. When we launched that initiative, there were a lot of uh, people in our industry were challenging us, is this the right way to go? Who is going to pay for this uh, uh, more expensive material? But we were convinced because the world needs to take care of uh, the climate change issue. So we were quite convinced that already at that time that the demand will come if we can develop this technology. Now, after almost six years, we have spent a huge amount of uh, resources and uh, developed this technology step by step. Uh, now we have delivered steel to Volvo. We have uh, uh, now a number of uh, very important customer collaborations really waiting for us to make this to happen. So next step is really how to speed up this transformation. SSAB did a decision early this year in January that we are now speeding up our transformation, moving ahead with our earlier goal of 2045 to around 2030. So we, we can do this tech with uh, our technology, but we need help. We can't do this alone because to make this happen, we need a quick permit process because that is really limiting our timeline. Uh, we need to have a permit that gave us the possibility to get electricity connection and also the in, uh, in investment in more renewable energy, which is uh, uh, also mentioned in the last panel. Mm. Uh, that is number one. And number two is that we need to collaborate also in a global level to push for a global carbon dioxide price. But that will further promote the market demand for fossil free steel. And last but not uh, least, we need to work together to create an internationally recognized, transparent standard of what is green steel. Because many people call their products as green, but we really need to create the transparency so our customers, our buyers, the youth can really recognize who is really doing the real change, mm. not only talking about change. Great, thank you. Okay, so what are the largest challenges connected to the resource and supply chain crisis? And is there anything that we can learn from it? Do you want to answer that, Linnea? Um, yes. Um, firstly, uh, one big challenge is that we cannot produce our food without phosphorus. Uh, we already know that we will see a lot of civil unrest because of uh, food shortage in the world. Uh, so that's a major problem we have. And the second problem that I would like to point out is the legislation. It is We need a global effort to update the legislation for a circular economy to allow recirculating nutrients and other materials in a safe way, obviously. So legislation is very important. What do you think are the largest challenges we have? I, I, w I would tend to agree that uh, enabling policies, it's a, it's a really important thing. And uh, for instance, in EU, the, the, obviously there's been a lot of policy development, for instance, in the packaging space. And many, many of these ideas and the concepts, they are very progressive. But then uh, looking at the global scale, I mean, when you don't have infrastructures for, for the waste management is, is not quite there. So, so there also needs to be kind of uh, the global south and global north, they need to collaborate because some of these issues, as we know from, for instance, the plastics crisis, they are global. So a lot of uh, this type of policy collaboration and and also maybe learnings, uh, you know, that would that would really help. I say that that it's uh, it's not, of course, uh, not just policy; it's uh, collaboration across sectors. But uh, and I think uh, this type of uh, events where you you meet different type of stakeholders and and you talk about all these uh, all these valuable uh, uh, kind of issues is really, really important, but it's actionable agendas. That's really what we what we need. Great. What would you say is the largest challenge? 
largest challenge for uh, well, the largest challenges connected to resource and supply chain crisis. Is there anything we can learn from it? Or do you think you already addressed this maybe? <laughs> no, I think, I think um, all companies need to develop their uh, strategies based on their own intelligence, based on the environment you are working on uh, and think long term. I think that's, that is one super big uh, dimension of it. And of course, uh, we have different situations in different companies, how long term we can be. But, but uh, the longer you think, the more you realize also that there will be disruptions that you need to build in uh, resilience for in your supply chains. Mm. Great. So now I'm going to ask you what we asked all the panelists before, the same question. It's a lot of noise out here. Uh, what are the key messages and agendas that need extra attention to, uh, to the road, on the road to and at COP27? And you can actually have pretty long answers because we're ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, was go I, I would be happy to happy to start. <coughs> I don't know if they're the right audience is here, but it, it would be a call a call for action to work across the, the food processing and packaging industry to, to really take leverage of the enabling uh, role that this industry can have in the in the food system transformation and, and look at the different, uh, you know, obviously there's the huge climate agenda, the role that circular economy can play, but also, you know, we, we know that the world is in, in food crisis. And so how do we balance this agenda and how do we, how do we, you know, I would I would like to see a COP27, you know, food at the center of the attention. Of course, energy and all that is interlinked, but that's that would be my wish. So the ferry ferry is listening now, maybe. Yeah, we hope so. And what do you think I want to see on the agenda? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see forestry on the agenda. Uh, I, I agree. I we will share that. Yeah, <laughs> great to hear. Because actually, uh, the way we handle our forest in the world and the way we use the wood has uh, will play a critical role in how we manage to mitigate climate change uh, and of course we know that uh, deforestation is one of the main drivers for the loss of biodiversity it's also one of the main drivers for co2 emissions and there is a lot of initiatives now uh, on reforestation and forest restoration which is great but it will never compensate stopping deforestation that must be number one and, and that calls for, I think, a lot of action. We need to uh, double down on impact now from, from governments and from the industry on stopping deforestation. That would be, I think, my main message. And I remember uh, a year ago, not even that, when I was standing in the queue in Glasgow listening to Boris Johnson declaring 141 leaders' declaration on forestry and land use. Super inspiring. And of course, what we want to see now in, in Sharm el Sheikh is a follow up and what has happened from those commitments from the government side and from the business side. I would like to see the big businesses taking responsibility beyond their own supply chains, going using their size to drive uh, change, using their profit to drive a sustainable change at scale because. Big companies can also be good companies, and that they need to show uh, and take responsibility for that in a bigger, bigger scale than they do today, and be transparent about it. Share progress and mistakes, and maybe by doing that also create a little bit of a peer pressure on each other. So that would be my wish for Shamal Sheikh. Okay, more peer pressure. Good. So it's, it's a it nature, helps. nature positive uh, coalition. How about yeah. that? Okay, yes. well, I think we're, we're ah, going to be in. <laughs> yeah. Good things <laughs> are coming. <laughs> I love this. Um, and what do you want to bring? Yes, um, we are um, now uh, in the forefront in developing this uh, new uh, value chain, uh, completely decarbonize or uh, uh, develop a, a fossil free value chain from uh, iron mining to steel making to manufacturing to delivering uh, machines to end customers like uh, construction companies and uh, transportation companies. SSAB, together with our partners, uh, Volvo and Vattenfall, we are all members of the First Movers Coalition. So taking action, we really want to do that. We are in this uh, position to do that. We produce uh, fossil free steel that Volvo can use for produce their machines. Uh, and we are committed to buy when they have available technology for us 
their trucks that can deliver goods for us. So that's uh, really to, to, to the business, I think we are ready. In our, in our value chain, we have taken the lead, taking our uh, action. Now we really need support. We need support from the government, authorities, and uh, the community around us to allow us our, say, to ex implement the accelerated, accelerated transformation plan that we have. We, we know that uh, the technology that we developed work. We have customers waiting for us, but what we are now limited is uh, to get electricity connection to the grid in time at the right place. Uh, that is really what we need. Again, emphasize global CO2 pricing from the global perspective, extremely important, driver demand, and also then transparency, what we do, so that we create a, a transparent standard, what we talk about. Great, thank you. And what key yeah. messages do you have? <laughs> I'm going to agree with you that it is very important that food systems is in focus, because that's, uh, uh, what's the word? I mean, that's essential for sustainable development. But uh, most of all, I would like to see a focus on circular material flows, because we can't reach the ambitions in the Paris Agreement without circular material flows. And I would like to see circular ambitions in all the NDCs, and I would like Sweden to be a forerunner in this. Great. Well, thank you so much for a great discussion and great insights. Ulf Johansson uh, at Inter-IKEA Group, Eja uh, Heitabu at Teta Pak, Linnea Selberg at Rangsells and Martin Pei at Assis AB. Thank you so much. All right, we're uh, wrapping up this whole uh, event. So I want to thank you, dear speakers and panelists, for your valuable and encouraging reflections. And thank you to everybody who tuned in today. And thank you to Business Sweden and Stockholm Plus 50 for hosting this pioneering event. We heard a lot today. We had heard everything about uh, it's important to dare to fail. We heard about the importance of transparency. We heard, we heard that we need to move from ambitions to actions. Uh, we even heard about uh, maybe there will be a nature positive coalition between Theater Park and IKEA and more, we hope. But there needs to be a global price on carbon. Uh, there's more support that everybody needs, access to information, and of course, the global circular roadmap. I must admit that I'm over the moon uh, over this, uh, that circular economy is finally discussed in these high level meetings uh, and in connection with climate change, solving climate change. So I feel more hopeful and inspired, uh, inspired after I listened to the distinguished speakers and pioneering companies here today. And I sincerely hope that you ha that have joined us uh, feel the same. The representatives from public and private sectors, civil society and academia share the importance, uh, important messages and conviction that climate transition is not only positive, but it also brings possibilities. The solutions and innovations that we need already exist today, but we must scale up and accelerate these transition uh, and climate solutions and collaborate more cross sectors and cross borders uh, to speed up the transition. So let's join forces to make this transformation uh, the greatest collab in human history happen. So join Sweden to pioneer the possible. Thank you. <laughs>